so many things that happen in our life every day. And yet many times we, we always coming to God and it's like we have forgotten so much of what God has done. And I believe that God has a call to remembrance for all of us. A call to remembrance. And uh, we're going to look at a few scriptures. Psalm chapter 77. This is David. Psalm 77. And it says, I call to remembrance my song in the night. I commune with my heart and my spirit made diligent search. This is something that David is saying, I'm doing. I'm doing. How many of you remember when Jesus saw the fig tree and he cursed the fig tree, right? I'm just going to put this scripture up in Mark 11. It says they passed by, they saw the fig tree that was dried up from the roots. And Peter, calling to remembrance, said to him, Master, look, the fig tree which you cursed is withered away. You see, many times there's things that are happening all around us that are a fulfillment of the promises of God. And yet, many times we're looking at our hands and we're just saying, well, well, Lord, we don't have much or I need this or that. And God is saying, but look at everything else. Look, look at everything else that I've done for you. It's kind of like when you have a child, right? And, and you've bought them so much, right? So much. And they, they talk about maybe one toy that they don't have or one thing that they don't have. And you just think, but you have so much. You've been given so much. The, the prodigal son said the same thing. I mean, the, the brother of the prodigal son, he, he said, look, you're, you're, you're giving this prodigal son this, this robe and this ring. You're doing all this for him. You're killing the fatted calf. What about me? And the father says, you're always with me. Everything I have is yours. You see, that, that's many times we're like that older brother and we're pointing, well, this person got this blessing, this person got this. And God says, why don't you take a look around and remember everything that God has done in your life? Because my friends, you are far richer than you think. You have far more riches in Christ and inheritance in Christ and blessings in Christ that you could ever imagine. It's like I remember when I went to Zimbabwe, Africa, and I went to uh, 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 um, India, and I remember being in the, uh, the uh, African stores and, and just looking, and particularly in India, the poverty. And in fact, in Africa, <clears throat> it, was, it was so poor, their currency was, uh, you know, it was the highest inflation in the world. And you, you go into the stores, and, and there might be, you know, there might be two of something. You walk into America and there's 20 selections of what flavor toothpaste you want. Are you hearing what I'm saying? And, and we have such an abundance. And, you know, we say, well, I couldn't find, you know, I couldn't find this certain thing I was looking for. You know, all of these things are a result of not remembering the goodness of God. And there is a, there is a calling for us to remember. Now, when Jesus in Luke 22 had his last supper, it says he took the bread in Luke 22, 19. He took the bread, he gave thanks, and he broke it. And he said, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in what? remembrance of me. And you realize that the bread represents the body of Christ. And you realize that we are the body of Christ. So when we come together, we're celebrating Jesus. We say, Jesus, we want to do this in remembrance of you. And I'm convinced in life that we need, there are things that God has called you to forget. There are past mistakes, 
sins, habits, things that have been washed by the blood of Jesus, encounters with people that were not good. You know, the Bible says, forget those things that are behind us. But we also need to remember the things unto victory. Remember the victories that God has given you in your life. Because when we fail to come before God, remembering those victories, we will have a tendency to complain. And there's nothing quicker that can short-circuit the blessings of God in your life than complaining. It's one of the worst things you can do because when you complain, you're telling God, He's not enough, He's not sufficient. Hallelujah. And so you've got to come to the place where you begin to remember all of these things that God has done. And this is not just something that's going to happen. This is something that you've got to stir up. In 2 Timothy, if you would, let's turn to 2 Timothy chapter 1. And we're going to begin reading in verse 3. And it says this, I thank God who I serve from my forefathers with pure conscience that without ceasing what? I have remembrance of you in my prayers night and day, greatly desiring to see you, being mindful of your tears that I may be filled with joy. Verse 5, when I call to remembrance the unfeigned faith that is in you, which dwelt in your grandmother Lois and thy mother Eunice, I'm persuaded in you also. Verse 6, Wherefore, I put who? Thee. I put you in remembrance. You see, Timothy was calling to remembrance, but then he had to put things in remembrance. We've got to realize that God wants you to remember some things. Amen? And it says here, that first of all, in verse 3, let's put that up there. It says, I have remembrance of you in my prayers. Then you go down to verse 5. It says, when I call to remembrance the unfeigned faith that is in you. And then in verse 6, wherefore, I put you in remembrance. You see, God is trying to call us to remembrance, and then we are supposed to call others and put other people in remembrance. In other words, if someone comes to you and they start saying about all these things that have happened, we begin to stop them and say, hey, but wait a second, don't you remember <laughs> when God did this for you? Don't you remember when God saved you? Don't you remember when you were out of your mind, God came through in that situation? And we begin to remember. We begin to remember the blessings of God. Many times the enemy just wants you to focus on the situation that's right at hand. But I'm telling you, many times the situation that you are facing, you've got to call to remembrance some of the past victories that God has given you so that you might be able to see his hand released in your life. David was the exact same way, King David. He didn't walk up one day and just start slaying giants. He didn't one day just decide he was going to come on the throne of Israel and start ruling. He didn't just start one day creating all these hundreds of different musical instruments and being in charge of all these musicians, the tabernacle of David, the lineage of Jesus. He didn't just start that way. He started out in a field with animals that, that were smelly, very undignified, just out in the middle of the field. And there were several tests, there were several seasons where things began to test his faith in God. 
And we see an account of this briefly in 1 Samuel chapter 17. If you've got your Bible, you can turn there, 1 Samuel. I'm going to share a little bit more about Samuel. We wouldn't be reading from a Samuel if there wasn't a Hannah. And we're going to talk a little bit about a Hannah and what Hannah had to give up so that you could read this nice book of Samuel right now. David said to Saul, this is when David had heard this Philistine mocking God. I pray that God would raise up a generation of those who have the heart of David in this earth, in this nation, that says, who are these people? Who are these legislators? Who are these people in government to think that they can defy the armies of the God of Israel? Who do they think they are? Who do these ministers think they are who can say it's okay for same-sex marriage? Hello? Do they not know that they're not defying the, they're not defying just people, they're defying the Lord God Jehovah? It would be better for them to step down from their ministry than to pretend to be a saint of God or a minister of God in leading people astray because those that are in offices of ministry who are operating in that will receive, the Bible says, greater damnation. So you better know what you're talking about when it comes to holiness, holy living, and when you try to tell people what God is saying. You better keep it down the middle. It's a serious thing. We live in a generation of people distorting, perverting the Word of God. And do you know many times the people in the world have more discernment than the church? They can turn something on and they can listen to something for five minutes and they can tell that this person is a fake. This person has no life in them and they're going through a ritual, a religious motion that is full of no power and no life. Why would I want that? Right? So we've got to be people like David who will stand up like he said here. David said to Saul, look, thy servant kept his father's sheep. And what happened? First came a lion. You know, the Bible says that the enemy tries to come, like, come at us like a roaring lion. And he, and he took, a, and a bear, and he took a lamb out of the flock. <laughs> Do you know, we have to have this same picture as believers in a local church. You realize that the enemy tries to take people out of the flock. And he'll try to use a lion. He don't care what he'll try to use. Situations, people, offenses. And, and it's not just the pastor's responsibility. It's our responsibility as a family to make sure that if the enemy is trying to take a, a, someone out of the flock, hallelujah, that we are going to say in the name of Jesus, you are not going to do that. Are you hearing what I'm saying? That we've got to come to the point of realizing that God has a mission in our lives, and it's very practical. It says there came a lion, a bear, and he took a lamb out of the flock. And David is talking to Saul in 35, verse 35, and I went out after him. I love that. When was the last time you went after the enemy? When he was trying to steal your goods. When he was trying to do something against your brother or your sister. When is the last time you just went after them? You said, oh, no, you're not. In the name of Jesus. Sometimes we're waiting for God to give us this huge sign. And God has already said, I've given you a sign. It's called my word. You know the word of God. You sense a situation is happening. God has given you revelation. You go to that sister. You go to that brother in meekness and in tears in your eyes and said, in the name of Jesus, the devil is not going to have his way in your life. I'm going to fight for you. I'm going to stand with you. And I don't care. I am going to be with you no matter what. When we start to have that kind of commitment as a church family, that's the kind of church that Jesus is building. It's not the church of high by. 
It's not the church where you say, how are you doing? Great. Bye. See you next week. That's not why Jesus came. Jesus did not come so we could have great social gatherings once a week. He came so that we could be a family, so that we could know what each other is going through, and we can be there and stand through with them through thick and thin no matter what they're facing. That's the church. That's the church. So it says here that David went after him, he smote him, and he delivered it out of his mouth. Think of this. David delivered the lamb. You know, I never knew that before. He didn't just, he didn't just kill the lion. He spared the sheep. He made sure that in the midst of him, doing God's business, that people weren't harmed, that that lamb was not harmed. God's desire is that his power would be used in your life. And when he arose against me, I caught him by his beard, and I smote him, and I killed him. I slew him. Now, verse 36, thy servant both slew the lion and the bear, and this uncircumcised Philistine will be as one of them. Seeing, why is he going to be that way? Because he's defied the armies of the living God. You see, when people try to come against Christians, when people try to come against God's chosen people, they're not coming against people. They are defying the armies of the living God. They're, fight, they're, wa they're waging a much bigger battle than they think because they're messing with one of God's people. Just like when we, have a, when we have a SWAT team or we have a military team that goes alone, you know, they have a term. Someone might know the term is, but basically no one is left alone. What's the term? Is that it? No man left behind. No man left behind because you've got this people here that are going and doing this mission, they make sure. But also, if we have a refugee, or if we have a hostage or something, if someone has taken one of our soldiers, let me tell you, their problem is not with that soldier. Hallelujah. You need to hear me. Their problem is with the United States government. Their problem is with the Air Force and the Navy and the Army and the Marines. You hear what I'm saying? Realize that the enemy is greatly outnumbered when he's trying to come against your life. And that he's not just messing with you. He is messing with the armies of the Lord of hosts, which the Lord of hosts, hallelujah, is a redemptive name of God. He refers to himself as the Lord of hosts. And hosts are people that are assembling themselves together for war. He is the Lord of hosts. Lord Sabaoth is his name. Now, David said this, moreover, watch what David said. The Lord that delivered me out of the paw of the lion, out of the paw of the bear, he will deliver me out of the hand of this Philistine. And David, Saul said to David, go and the Lord be with you. You see, David, remember this. David didn't just remember his previous victories. He remembered these victories, but that it wasn't in his ability. David wasn't like, I trained for years on how to kill lions and bears, and so I knew exactly what I needed to do. No, David had faith, and it says, the Lord that delivered me. It was the Lord that delivered him. See, he wasn't thinking about how great and wonderful David was. He was thinking how great and wonderful and awesome God's mighty deliverance was in his life. And it was the Lord that delivered David out of the mouth of the lion and the bear. And it was the Lord that was going to make sure that he had a future victory. So you remember God's past victories, his delivering power in your life. And that will encourage your faith to realize that whatever you're facing, he's going to deliver you. You hear me? He's going to deliver you. But you keep your eyes on Jesus. Right? Now, doesn't mean that it's easy. But if you will remember God, 
he will remember you. I think about a thief on the cross. I think about someone that had no reason to have any kind of reward. He was a thief. But he told Jesus two things, two words. Remember me. That was it. He wasn't a, a great person. He was just a repentant person. So I want to tell you something. God is not looking at how perfect you are. God is just wanting these words to come out of your mouth. Lord, remember me. You call out to God. God is a God who remembers us. He does not forget his people. I think about a woman named Hannah. Hannah was barren. She was ridiculed. The Bible actually says that there was somebody that would actually torment her and just, just really dig it in that she was barren. You're barren. And she would go up every year and she, she was faced with this situation, what would seem defeat, Hannah. And she was so overcome with grief, she couldn't even speak when she prayed. Did you know that? She's just so overcome with grief. Hannah, how many of you ever been in that situation? It's about Lord Jesus. Let's turn there. First Samuel. First Samuel. My God. First Samuel, verse 1. It says here, chapter 1, verse 10, she was in bitterness of soul. This is Hannah. She's crying out to God because she's a woman with no child. She prayed to the Lord and she wept sore. She vowed a vow. She, she said, O Lord of hosts, if you will look on the affliction of your handmaiden and remember me. What did she pray? Remember me and not forget your handmaid. But if you will give me a man child, then I will give him to the Lord all the days of his life. Boy, that's a serious prayer. And there will not be a razor come upon his head. Now watch this. As verse 12, as it came to pass, she continued praying before the Lord that Eli marked her mouth. He was the priest. He's the priest inside the temple. She's in the temple praying, and he's watching this lady. And it says here, verse 30, now Hannah, she spoke in her heart. Only her lips moved, but her voice was not heard. So she's praying this prayer, but you can't hear what she's saying. She's over, so overcome with grief. Therefore, watch this, Eli thought she had been what? She was in such anguish, she was in such pain, she was in such turmoil that she was overcome with grief in the temple of God. There are many people who are hurting. There are many people in the church that have got things going on in your life. And my friend, it is okay to pour out your pain and your heart to the Lord. It is not a diminishing of your faith for you to cry in the presence of God and say, Lord, my affliction is greater than I can bear. But it's what you do with it. Verse 14, Eli said to her, how long are you going to be drunk? Put away wine from you. He was convinced the woman was drunk. And Hannah said, no, my Lord, I'm a woman of a sorrowful spirit. I have drunk neither wine nor strong drink, but I've poured out my heart before the Lord. Do not count, do not count your handmaiden for a daughter of Belial. That was a false god. For out of the abundance of my complaint and grief have I spoken thereto. Then Eli answered and said, Go in peace. The God of Israel grant you your petition. 
that you have asked of him. Verse 18, and he said, let your handmaiden find grace in your sight. So the woman went her way and did eat. Her countenance was no more, more sad. Verse 19, they rose up early in the morning. They worshiped before the Lord. I want to stop here. What's her attitude now? Has she received the promise yet? But what is she doing? She's worshiping God. She's worshiping God. She returned. They came to the house of Ramah. They rose up in the morning. I'm sorry. And uh, Elkanah knew Hannah, his wife, and the Lord did what? The Lord remembered her. The Lord remembered Hannah. I've got a word for you today that if you will trust in God and you will worship the Lord and you will not complain and come to the point of surrender, the Bible says the Lord will remember you. Verse 20, wherefore it came to pass when the time was come about after Hannah had conceived, she bare a son, named his name Samuel, because I have asked him of the Lord. Now, I want to stop right here, though, because we can all the, all the confetti and all the, the party balloons and everything, but guess what happens now? Now she, she breastfeeds this child. She weans this child probably to his three and four years old. Now what does she do with that child? She takes that child that was the source of all this grief that she was bearing, and she commits what she had told the Lord. You see, the same way you want the Lord, you want God to remember you, He's going to remember you. He's going to remember some of the things that we've said. He's going to remember the things that we have to obligate ourselves to the kingdom of God. There are things that God requires of His people. There are things that God requires of his people. And you realize that she took this baby, probably four years old, five years old, brings him to the temple and says, he's yours. Now, not only does she do this, but after she does this, you can read it in the Word of God just a few chapters later, a few verses later, she begins to talk about how great and wonderful God is. She begins to brag on the Lord. She begins to say how awesome God is that he gave her a man-child that she ended up taking back to the temple and letting uh, Eli, the priest, raise him. Are you starting to see something here? That we're always thinking that things are always just going to happen just the way we think it's going to happen. But I'm telling you, God has a way that he does things. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I remember talking to different people before. You talk about, you want to do business with God? You better be sure you know what you're talking about. Because God will take you up on your word. But you see, the ways of God, sometimes they will test our faith. Because I want you to know that Hannah, the same woman, took this child, who, by the way, was Samuel, right? What happened to Samuel? He became one of the greatest prophets that we know of. He's the one that came to David and said, David, you are the man. He's the one that God used to anoint King Saul. Amen? See, when you have a promise that God has given you, and you begin to release that promise into God's hands, God will use that thing for his glory. But not only that, because she had such a great attitude, can you say attitude, your attitude matters to God. He hears our attitudes in remembering. God said, Hannah, I can just see God. Look at Hannah. I remember her. She couldn't even, she couldn't even speak. And all she asked for was a child. That's all she asked for. So you know what God does? He gives her three more sons and two other daughters. Can you say hallelujah? Hallelujah. So you realize that the ways of God, God wanted that Samuel, man. He wanted Samuel to be raised in the ways of God. And there are things, there are areas in our life that the Lord is saying, are you going to release it to me or are you not going to release it to me? She could have held on, oh boy, now I got my son, I got my son, and not made good on what she had told the Lord. 
And we probably wouldn't be reading about it today either. Now, finally, the last portion of Scripture I want to go to today is 2 Peter. 2 Peter. The point is, if you will live in the remembrance for God, you will be in the remembrance of God. In other words, God wants you to have this realm of treasure of remembrance where your life, when people encounter you, they're not just encountering where you are right now. They're encountering all of the remembrance of the great things that God has done in your life. Simple things. Simple things. Simple desires. The fact that we've been believing God for so many things, believing God for my sister, my brother-in-law, hallelujah, my mother, that God has moved them here, that's something I need to remember. I need to remember the fact that, that when I was leading worship in Seattle, Washington, I would take these blue speakers and this with a case that was 100 pounds up a flight of stairs so I could lead worship in this guy's living room. And I was in this guy's living room leading worship. And then I got a call to go to Little Rock, Arkansas. I went from someone's living room to being on staff at a church of 1,000 people. That's the hand of God in our lives. I think of just how all of these things. You've got things that God has, amen? Can you think of anything that God has ever done in your life? I mean, just something. You take those experiences, and instead of the enemy trying to throw his junk into your mixing bowl, hallelujah, you throw it out, and you just take all the ingredients of all the good things that God has done in your life. And you begin to stir those things up. And you begin to say, hallelujah, Lord. How, how is this smelling to you, Lord Jesus? How is this aroma smelling to you? He says, my son, my daughter, this is, this is beautiful. How did you, how, wh what are you doing? Well, Lord, I've decided to remember you. I've decided to remember your goodness. Come on. I've decided to remember what God has done. I've decided to remember how he's brought me through time and time again. When there didn't seem to be any hope, I remember how God came through for me. I remember how God told me that, we, that uh, the doctor told me that we could only have one son. Looked right in my face. You cannot have another child. And yet we have Nathaniel Paul. Right? I look at all of the things that God had, had, that people have tried to say and what God has done in my life, right? And it hasn't been without trial. It hasn't been without persecution. It hasn't been without disappointments, but my God is faithful. And if I learn to do things God's way, if I learn to accept the things that come from His hand, hallelujah, and begin to mix my faith with the things that I, can, that I know I'm remembering the goodness of God, then my life will become this acceptable fragrance to God. Live in the remembrance of God. Live in the remembrance of God. You, some of you need to start writing some songs. You need to start writing some things down. You need to just say, now, how did God do this in my life? How did God do this in my life? And you begin to remember, and you begin to say, and you should be humbled in complete silence to think, who am I to ever say anything about the hand of God in my life? Right? I said, right? You begin to look at all the things God has done in your life. And you say, blessed be the name of the Lord. We just forget about it. He comes through. He comes through every time. Now, 1 Peter, Simon Peter, a servant and apostle of Jesus Christ, to them that have obtained like precious faith with us through the righteousness of God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Verse 2, grace and peace be multiplied to you. How? Through the knowledge of God and of Jesus Christ our Lord. I'm just going to stop right here. The whole purpose that God wants you to remember things is not so that you can have more victories. 
God is not wanting you to remember things so things are going to go nice and wonderful in your life. God doesn't want to give you more victories so you can get more stuff. God wants to give you more victories, hallelujah, so that you can know Him. So that you can know Him. That's the goal. The goal is not the stuff. Hallelujah. That's where many people miss it. Because they're looking at the stuff, and God's saying, man, there's a higher way, and that is to know me, to know my way. See, when you know God, you know, it doesn't matter what happens in this life. My, it's a vapor, man. It's a vapor. It is over and gone, and you're in eternity. That's why Paul, man, they got thrown in prison. They got sawed in half. They got beaten, stolen. Their goods were pillaged. I mean, all of these things would happen. And yet they say, this is a light affliction. Our names are written in the Lamb's book of life. We have eternity to spend with Jesus. And regardless of what happens to me in this life, I'm going forward and I'm going to give honor and glory to my God and my King. Hallelujah. Don't seek the stuff. See, grace and peace are multiplied through knowing God. Leonard Ravenhill would say most Christians, many Christians, simply do not know God. The things that they say, the things that they do, the way they act, they simply don't know Him in the way that God wants to reveal Himself to them. And it says here, verse 3, according as His divine power has given us all things that pertain to life and godliness, how? Through the knowledge of Him that has called us to what? You see, let's just say, say this. I'm closing in about 10 minutes here. Just say this. I'm called to glory and virtue. This is what you're called to. You are called to glory. You are called to virtue. That's how God has created you. What does it mean to be called to glory? That means that the glory of the Lord is your portion. That God's glory is available for your life. That the virtue of God is available to you. It says you are called to glory and virtue. You're called to glory and virtue. Verse 4, whereby we are given great and exceeding promises, that by these you might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. Beside this, verse 5, giving all what? Diligence. See, I want you to understand that the Word of God is not some kind of uh, book that you just pick things out and it's just like, well, if I say this little prayer, it's just uh, going to happen. You know? It's not a formula. This is a person. This is Jesus. He is the Word of God, right? Right? And the Bible says to give all diligence in verse 5. Hear me this morning. Give all diligence. In other words, there are things that God is requiring us to do. And the first thing is add to your faith virtue. And then it says to virtue what? Knowledge. Man, dig in the Word of God. Dig in His Word, and to knowledge, temperance, to temperance, patience, to patience, godliness, to godliness, brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness, charity. We could preach a week on each one of those things. For if these things be in you, what is He talking about? He's talking about things that you're doing. He's talking about adding to your faith virtue, knowledge, temperance, patience, godliness. If these things are in you and abound, watch this, they make you so that you will neither be barren or unfruitful in the what? Of who? You see, this is not a religious code that we're trying to keep. See, God is wanting to reveal who He is to you. And, the, and it says right here that if you will do these things, if you'll add to your faith virtue and knowledge and brotherly love and godliness and temperance, right? If these things are in you and abound, you will be, you will be fruitful and you won't be barren. In fact, you'll be pregnant and giving life, hallelujah, in the knowledge of God. It doesn't just say you'll be fruitful. 
You see, you can be successful, right, in the kingdom. You can, you can, maybe you can win a lot of people to the Lord. Maybe you can raise the dead. You can heal the sick. You can do all these things. But that is not the treasure. The treasure is in knowing God. So realize all of these things in remembering God and remembering the things that He's done in our life is just not for us to realize His hand or His acts or the things that He's done, but for us to actually know Him and to have knowledge of who He is in our life. That's the treasure of life, to know God, to sense something about a situation before it even happens. Why? Because you know Jesus. You know Him. You know, you know many times what He's going to say about something, what He's going to do about a situation. Verse 9, but He, this is a strong word, He that lacks these things is blind. What is it talking Lacking what? Temperance, godliness, faith, virtue, brotherly love, okay? Someone that lacks these things, the Bible says, is blind, cannot see afar off, and has what? Forgotten that he was cleansed from his old sins. In, in fact, the Bible, it just says it right here, you've forgotten. Many times when there's all this stuff in our life that we're wrestling with, that God is trying to do in our life, we simply have forgotten of the goodness of God. We've forgotten the fact that He has washed us whiter than snow. And see, this is not talking to an unbeliever. This scripture is talking to Christians. There's millions of Christians in this nation that can't see far off because they've forgotten that they've been cleansed. Hallelujah. And so we realize, thank you, Jesus, for your cleansing power. But now, verse 10, wherefore the brethren, rather brethren, there's the word again, give what? Give diligence to make your calling and election sure. And remember, your calling and election in life is not a position in the kingdom. Your calling and election in life is your relationship in knowing God. That's your calling. That's your commission in Jesus. And it says here, if you will do these things, you will what? Never fall. Can you say never fall? The Bible's, God's desire is that you would never fall. Hallelujah. It doesn't mean that if you, you do fall that you're bad. It just means you've got to remember. Verse 11, for so an entrance will be ministered to you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Verse 12, wherefore I will not be negligent to put you when? Always, say always, always in remembrance of these things, though you know them and be established in the present truth. Yes. I think it necessary, as long as I'm in this tabernacle, this body, to stir you up. How? By putting you in remembrance. Do you, are you starting to see something here? Verse 14, knowing that shortly I must put off my body, this tabernacle, even as Lord Jesus Christ has shown me. Verse 15, moreover, I will endeavor that you may be able after my death to have these things always in remembrance. Look, I'm putting in your remembrance. God's put me in remembrance. I'm going to put you in remembrance. And my goal here is that after I'm dead, that you will still have these things always in your memory. Hallelujah. Is it important? So you just realize, God, let me remember what you have done. In fact, I just want you to take one minute, and I want you to think about one of the darkest times of your life, and I want you to think about...